Good afternoon and welcome to the September 9th, 2021 QRA board meeting. I'm Diamante Walker. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the OPD Development Authority, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Executive Director Greg Slistrom and Chairman Sam Williamson. I do believe that Chairman Williamson is here with us, and we are waiting for a few other board members, and we will have a forum. Good afternoon. Yeah. Looks like we've got Jody and uh, Daniel. And Director Powell is connecting her audio. Here. All right, I think everybody looks like all uh, all five board members are present. Uh, I'm Sam Williamson, and I think uh, everything is ready to go. We can convene the September 9th. Uh, 2021 regular board meeting of the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Pittsburgh. Let the record show all five members of the board are present. So no roll call is really necessary. First really order of business will be approval of the minutes from both the June 17th and August 12th board meetings. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And, uh, and then we can move right into public comment. I know we have a uh, handful of registrants for public comment. Uh, we've got a lot of submissions of written comment, uh, which we are no longer reading out loud in the board meetings because we have live public comment available. Um, but they have been all the all the uh, public comment that we received in writing has been distributed to the whole board is available on the URA's website for members of the public. Um, and there was I'll just summarize we got a lot of submissions regarding the skinny building. Uh, over 50 people wrote in about the skinny building. We got a handful of submissions about the Woods Village project in Hazelwood, um, and I think one uh, regarding the Amani Christian Community Development Corporation and Fifth and Dinwiddie project. Uh, I believe those are all the written public comment submissions that we received. But why don't we go to live public comment? I don't know who's handling that. The first, what I've got is that the first live public comment registrant is Eric Cook. Yes, it doesn't appear that Eric is on yet. So let's move to, um, I'm looking who is on. Uh, Pastor Love is, uh, on, so I will allow him to speak at this time. Uh, Pastor Love, you have, uh, once you begin starting, you have three minutes. I'll let you know when you have about 10 seconds left. Pastor, you've got to unmute yourself. You should have that ability. Um, while the pastor is uh, figuring that out, let's see, um, Sandra Cole.
Are you uh, on Sandra, Sandra? Um, Sandra, you were unmuted, now you're muted again. There you go. Oh. Uh, you have three okay. minutes. There you go. Oh, it's my turn now? Yes. I was trying to figure this out because I'm confused, but that's okay. Um, you got it. We can hear you now. So go ahead. Okay. So um, my take on the um, Oak Moss development, I'm a long-term resident from the Hazelwood community. And I've been here a long time. And where he wants to develop used to be families there, families like three and four bedroom family homes that was there. And at that time, that's when the community was a village. It's when it was a village. And that's what we're trying to bring back into our Hazelwood community. Sense of village, people taking care and looking after one another. And I believe that that area, I support him 100% with that area that he wants to develop up there. And not only do he want to develop, he also, he don't just want to develop the brick and mortar, but he also want to develop the people who's inside our community. And that's a, a lot of times that people get overlooked, but I believe with his project, he's bringing the whole package. And this package that he's bringing, we haven't had in a long time in our community. He supports our community. He's been to several meetings in our community to um, make sure that our voices are included in his development. So my take on this development and the, and the residents that I do um, help out through throughout this community, they, they are pretty much standing with Mr. Krish on this development because it is family oriented. So my take on it is that I would support as well as the families who su support Poor Laws for, um, Organization. We support his development out in our community. And I think that it will help build the people that, that has been forgotten about out in our community. So that's what I'm, 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 I'm hoping that he does get the votes that he need to bring this development because it would definitely uplift the people versus the brick and mortar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I believe uh, Pastor Love is still having some difficulty getting unmuted. Uh, Adelaide is trying to help him out with that. Uh, in the meantime, let's see. Um, I believe Michael Wilson is next. Uh, uh, Michael, you're uh, un, you're now able to speak, so uh, your your three minutes will begin uh, when you begin talk. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, voice my uh, opinion around this matter. Uh, as you said, my name is Michael Wilson, and I'm a uh, over 20 plus year resident of the greater Hazelwood community. Today, I'm representing the residents of Glen Hazel and public housing residents, low income residents in the greater Hazelwood community. Uh, as it relates to the Oak Moss development team, they have made a sincere effort uh, to reach out to the entire community over the past six to nine months. They've actually attended no fewer than six public meetings across various community development groups uh, in the greater Hazelwood area, um, as well as has formed uh, a project steering committee for ongoing community engagement. Uh, they have also shared the master plan that, you know, for their site, uh, their townhouse unit concept, and all the relevant details of the development. Uh, in addition, they have also listen very carefully uh, to what we, uh, the residents, have been saying uh, and made changes uh, in their plans and designs to align with what the community uh, needs and, and wants were. 
Um, they've also formed a steering committee of any interested community residents to meet regularly and to voice their community concerns that might influence their plans. Um, two meetings of the steering committee held uh, were very well attended. Uh, and if we can uh, have all of our developers to come into our community be as sincere and um, their approach and be as um, sure in their follow up um, as as it relates to the promises that they make coming in. Um, that stuff needs to match up to uh, the work that they're doing. And and you know we feel is Oak Moss has done just that and can possibly be a model for other developers as you know. Um, coming into our, our neighborhood, you know, that, that would be a great uh, a benchmark, right? Standard operating procedure to understand that the people in the community need lifted up just like the buildings need lifted up and the people need some pre-work. You know, they have taken um, the initiative to operate their own workforce uh, development right out of their their own um, profits, you know? So if that's the stage and if that is what they're bringing to our neighborhood, anyone that goes against that development into our neighborhood obviously do not have the people of our community's best interests at heart. Um, and, you know, I just, I would like to uh, just reiterate the fact in case you missed it, but we are for uh, Oak Moss uh, development team proceeding the next step uh, and the development phase of the Woods Village project. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Michael. Uh, Pastor Love has been able to get his audio issue worked out. So, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, you have three minutes. Uh, please begin whenever uh, you're ready. Thank you very much, and praise the Lord, everybody. I'm Pastor Love. I'm the pastor of Praise Temple Deliverance Church in Hazelwood. I'm also the senior development consultant for Poor Law and the co-founder and senior coordinator for the Greater Hazelwood Coalition Against Racial and Ethnic Disparities. Um, for the past several months, I've been working with the Oakmont Development, Mr. Krish, and um, We've been attending his meetings uh, that he had in the community. He actually changed his design uh, at least three times since we first started meeting. So that goes to show you that he has been listening to the community. He's also involved, actually be involved in other uh, developments in our community, assisting us in um, trying to reach a, a, a position of diversity, equity, and inclusion as we move forward, we, I know that we're not calling to support his development. I want to make that clear, but we're I'm calling to support his opportunity to move forward so that he will get to a point where he can submit something that we can uh, support or not support. We feel that it's unfair uh, uh, for a, uh, a city owned person, a businessman to get that opportunity and then uh, instead of giving the opportunity to other people like City Bridges and other people who are not from Pittsburgh to come out and do the 4800 block in Hazelwood. And, and they got the opportunity at least to move forward. So all we're asking for is he get the oper same opportunity that you afforded everyone else out there in the 4800 block and the developments going on in Hazelwood to be able to go forward and present himself and present a project that may be worthy uh, in our community. So um, we, he also is involved with uh, workforce development. Currently in our community, he's in uh, activities to help us get jobs, uh, development of an equity uh, one-stop shop that he has volunteered for, had his um, contract to volunteer and uh, architects come in just to assist us. So he's doing more than just this just um, looking for some cash and run. So we're asking you to give them an opportunity to be able, the same opportunity you gave everyone else to be fair, uh, you know, and transparent at the people who got an opportunity. We don't think that one organization should be, have the right to choose who are developers, who are not developers for our community. 
uh, we believe that everybody should have a right to, in, to give input. So we hope that you take our input uh, to the same grain of salt as the other people that, um, the other organization that doesn't want them. And we believe it's a conflict of interest anyway. So. About 10 seconds. Right, sir. Hey, you have about 10 seconds left. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I don't. Uh, so we ask that you just give them the same opportunity that other developers have uh, been given by the URA to present a, uh, a chance to present his project. Thank you very much to everybody for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, um, we have uh, Patrick Clark. Uh, Patrick, uh, you should now be able to unmute yourself and your three minutes will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all? Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to speak a piece on the Skinny Building proposal. Um, by way of uh, background, um, I'm the uh, uh, founder and principal of Jackson Clark Partners. Uh, we've worked over the years extensively with the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Pittsburgh and have had great relationships with you over the years um, on a client basis. Prior to then, um, I was an adversary of the URA. Um, during the Murphy administration, uh, I was one of the principal uh, activists who fought the fifth Forbes program uh, that was developed by a number of uh, 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 organizations in the region at the behest of uh, former Mayor Tom Murphy. And part of, part of that initiative was finding those things within the footprint of fifth Forbes downtown that were of value and uh, that we could point to as a reason to maintain what was at the time a thriving downtown business district and has continued to be so um, since then as a result of uh, activists successfully stopping the plan for Fifth Forbes. And uh, I was very part, proud to be a part of that. Part of the, the reason we wanted to do that was to bring relevance to the community um, that used downtown and still does. And I would point out, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that uh, one of the core arguments of uh, maintaining the downtown footprint uh, that, and, and preventing it from becoming a mall that wasn't supposed to be a mall because it would look like where they were just tore, tear, just what they just tore down, um, which made no sense to me, is that it was the principal shopping district for a large percentage of uh, Pittsburgh's uh, African-American population. Um, and I, I bring that up specifically because the skinny building itself has a tradition of being one of the few remaining uh, structures, uh, especially in downtown Pittsburgh, that has a relevant history to the African-American community. I think that's important in pointing out that my concern about a proposal um, where the URA would develop that property is in the integrity of the structure itself. There are many opportunities, I think, where a facade, uh, and I'm not an architect, so I don't presume to be an expert on it, um, but where a retention of a facade, facade would be important. In this case, it means nothing. The integrity of the building is the structure itself. On our, on our research way back in the day, um, 2000, 2001, when uh, we had a sublease to put art into that facility, we found that it in fact was arguably the, the skinniest sliver building in the world, certainly a commercial building. And if all you have left is the facade, that goes away. I'll say what I said at the time. Downtown Pittsburgh is a remarkable jewel. And the more we degrade those structures downtown that are important, the less of a jewel we're left with. And I have to seconds. say, the people are the critical portion of this. That's where I've spent my work, not on saving buildings. And I think the people of Pittsburgh deserve to retain this skinny building in its entirety. Thank you. Uh, next up is Dean Bog. Hello. Hi, uh, you have three minutes. Okay, I'm speaking on the uh, wood development. Uh, the Woods Village development. Um, yeah, can everybody hear me? Or can you hear me? All yes. Right? Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to speak um, 
just as someone who uh, supports kind of the preservation of the, of the green spaces here in Pittsburgh, I, I don't know much about the developer and, and if they are, you know, a, a someone who is going to do something good for the community, then I definitely would, would support their development. I just don't think that that forest is the appropriate place for it. Um, speaking with some of the environmentalists of Hazelwood, um, they seem to be against development in that forest because it is such an important connector for that greenway. Um, in, the, in the words of Matt Peters, you know, we're a city of bridges and that strip of, of forest is very much a bridge that connects the greenway into Shenley. Um, yeah, I think there's a, a, lot of, a lot of opportunity for development uh, in Hazelwood where, they're, where it is more appropriate. But to me, destroying that forest seems so counterintuitive. I think that forest there is so valuable. It's so beautiful. It's healthy. It's young. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm for dense cities. I'm not, this is not a, a NIMBY thing. This is not a not in my backyard thing. Um, but it, it just doesn't make sense to wipe that forest down when there are, there is so much land available elsewhere uh, that is ripe for development. Um, I think that, you know, it, it doesn't seem like much, but this is global warming and climate change on a microscopic scale. Um, and uh, yeah, so again, I, I would support, if the community members feel that it's a good development that I'm for it, I just don't think that that forest is a good spot for it. And I hope that that forest is preserved because it is extremely important um, to the area and to, to the city. Thank you. Okay, um, the last two registered public comments were Jill Diskin and Eric, or yeah, Eric Cook. Uh, I don't see either of you in the uh, meeting room. So if you are in the meeting room and perhaps listed under a different name, could you please uh, raise your Zoom hand or uh, send us a, a ch chat in the Q and A? It doesn't look uh, like they are present. Um, that is all registered Thanks, public comment. Uh, Joan Stone, a registrant. She had something in the, she just said in the chat, me too. Oh, she's the ASL interpreter. I was just letting her know when she joined that we were all on the meeting. Okay. Okay, so that I think concludes public comment for today's meeting. As I said, there was a there were a significant number of uh, written submissions as well, in addition to what we just heard live. Fifty or so were regarding the skinny building, which we'll talk about when we get to it on the agenda. Uh, another nine, I think, were regarding the uh, Oak Moss development, which we will also hear about more about today. Uh, and then the final one was was uh, from the Hill CDC regarding. Uh, the Amani CDC and Fifth and Dinwiddie projects. So with that, I think we can uh, move on to the rest of today's agenda, beginning with Center Avenue, I think. Yep. So I think, uh, is Chuck Alcorn the primary presenter here? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Chuck Elkhorn, Project Development Manager presenting the New Granada Office Building proposed by uh, New Granada Development LLC, an affiliate of a Hill CDC. Authorization is required to enter exclusive negotiations for four URA owned vacant parcels, and it's just west of a historic New Granada theater. The project will include 21,000 square feet of office space, first floor uh, retail space, rooftop deck, and 14 integrated parking spaces. This project is part of a redevelopment of a new Granada theater block. A few storefronts down the street includes the now under construction new Granada apartments with affordable housing. Uh, the historic new Granada theater itself is also being renovated separately 
but the new office building will be connected to a theater. This exclusive negotiation period is for six months, but the development is anticipated to come back soon to the URA board for uh, approval of a proposal package, and then again for final approval of construction drawings and evidence of financing. Marimba Malayans from the Hills at EC should be in attendance if there are any questions. Uh, Marimba, do you want to add anything? Uh, thank you for considering uh, this project today. As you all know, this is uh, the catalyst for the redevelopment of Center Avenue uh, relative to its size, its scale, uh, and its historic importance to the uh, Center Avenue corridor. This is uh, one building, uh, which is a part of a, an entire block transformation. Um, and so um, we're really eager to move forward. As you can see from the connector uh, there in the picture, this is connected to the historic building. And we are working on this project uh, comprehensively um, uh, as, as, as one development, but we cannot do that without uh, the parcels that are here um, represented um, in this picture uh, where the New Granada office building sits. And so, uh, we appreciate your consideration uh, and we are eager to move forward and we appreciate the support of the URA staff. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments from the board? So this is the beginning of exclusive negotiations. So we'll see this a number of times before final, before final action. If there are no questions, then a motion would be in order. Moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Motion to second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. We are very open about our team and the people who have. And uh, staying on Center Avenue, we've got the Amani Christian Thank Community you. Development Corporation project. Once again, we are. Hi, um, I'm Leah Matthews, and today I'm requesting authorization for the proposal and form of contract for the sale of three URA-owned parcels in the Fifth Ward to Amani Christian Community Development Corporation or a related entity for $27,300 plus cost. The Amani project will rehabilitate the African Queens building and construct an 18,000 square foot mixed use building that will include first floor commercial space and 12 affordable residential units above. There will be nine one bedroom units and three two bedroom units. The total development cost is estimated to be $4.9 million. When presented at the District 6 community meeting last September, the project received a, an approval score of 95%. The Amani project is part of the larger Center Avenue request for qualifications process. The goal of the process is to revitalize the Center Avenue corridor with development projects that align with the neighborhood plan and keep community ownership in mind while building the development capacity of local developers. The other priorities of this process include building upon the African American cultural legacy of the Hill District and fostering economic empowerment. Amani Christian will be the fourth developer out of the seven participating in the process to come to the board for proposal acceptance. I have Reverend Walls here with me today to answer any questions the board may have. Uh, no questions, uh, Councilman? No, I don't have any questions, um, I, but I do wanna congratulate Mr. Walls, thank him for his, uh, his willing to stick with this. Um, it's been a long process, um, but I'm, I'm grateful for him to sticking with it. Also, I um, just want to say congratulations to the Hill CDC on the prior um, one that came before us. Thank you. Um, I want to note and acknowledge for the record that the public comment we received from the CDC on this project was principally thanking uh, the URA and Amani for uh, completing the DRP project process for this project. Any other uh, comments?
comments, questions, thoughts about this proposal? Motion to approve. <clears throat> Second. Motion is seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, so we've got uh, one residential lending project to consider in East Hills today. And I think Shana Madden is going to present on this one. Yeah, thank you. My name is Shana Madden, and I am the acting director of the Housing Lending Department. We have two authorizations for your consideration today related to the second East Hills Phase 1 Regen Redevelopment. Please note that there is a typo in the agenda. The project is titled Second East Hills Phase 1 Regen, not Second East Hills Phase 2 Regen. The two authorizations are final authorization to issue multifamily bonds in an amount up to $12 million for the second East Hills phase one regen redevelopment and authorization for the prestigious Hills LP or a related entity to assume a $390,000 rental housing development and improvement loan from the East Hills limited partnership that closed on August 14th, 2004. First, I'll give you a little bit of background about the development, and then I'll take a deeper dive into the financial components of the authorizations. Second East Hills Phase 1 Regen is a 117-unit community located in the East Hills neighborhood. Orig originally built in 1969, this multifamily community is part of a larger 404-unit phase development. Their proposed phase is comprised of 29 buildings that house 80 th 87 three-bedroom units and 34 bedroom units. 93 units will be rented to households at or below 50% area median income, and 24 units will be rented to households at or below 30% AMI. All units are supported with a long-term HUD Housing Assistance Program Section 8 contract. Telesis, the owner developer, acquired the property in 2004 and completed a major rehabilitation utilizing 9% low-income housing tax credits. More than 15 years later, these units now require new investment to continue to provide safe and healthy living environments for the residents. The redevelopment will occur through the 4% low-income housing tax credit program. The total development cost is approximately $22.3 million with a cost per unit of $190,000. The 4% tax credit program is a non-competitive is non-competitive and requires partnering the equity with tax exempt bonds, which is what we're here to discuss today. The tax exempt bonds are debt obligations issued by state or local government agencies, such as the URA for multifamily affordable rental housing. The IRS code allows the purchasers of these bonds to deduct the interest income from the federal gross income taxes. As a result, the interest rate on tax exempt bonds is lower than conventional bank financing typically by about 2%. So the bank that purchases the bonds that the URA issues is able to lend the funds to the project, which will finance the renovation activities at a lower interest rate. The project equity that can be raised through the 4% tax credits along with lower interest rates produced through the tax exempt bonds are great financing tools to support affordable housing. Through this program, 117 units will be preserved for an additional 40 years. Final authorization is now requested for the issuance of the tax exempt bonds in the amount of $12 million. The bonds will be publicly placed with Stifle International as the underwriter, Zions Bank as the trustee, and Clark Hill as bond counsel. The project is slated to close by the end of 2021. The current owner of Second East Hills Phase 1 Regen is a limited partnership called East Hills LP. A new limited partnership, Prestigious Hills LP, is created to move the development forward. In addition to approving the bond inducement, Telesis is asking that the URA assign the existing URA debt on the property to this new entity. Max Glickman and Laura Lazarus of Telesis are both here today to answer any questions you may have on the project. Thank you. Any questions, comments from the board? Yes, um, Sam, I just want to thank Laura um, and Telesis. Um, Prestigious Hills was a name that was selected by Connie Wells, and I know that they have been working for quite a bit on this development right here. Um, I just want to let them know I appreciate them. They know, like I know, the day was her funeral. Um, she, was a, she was a matriarch in East Hills for a long time. 
drove a lot of the first development. Um, she passed away at the age of 73. And during the course of the funeral, it was brought up that um, she worked with Tellus, Tellus Hills because she didn't want to name East Hills. She wanted to name Prestigious Hills. So first, I just want to congratulate Tellus and thank them for working with the community. Um, and a leader like that, being able to take her recommendation and make it happen. So I just want to um, congratulate them and say thank you. I, not a, a question, but a, an additional comment. Um, you know, as always, I have to point out that there are multiple uh, three bedroom units and four bedroom units, which is uh, amazing to have, I think, again, more uh, affordable units for families and, and um, you know, units more than one. Um, one thing I think that's obviously outside of the purview of this board, but, um, you know, going forward, if we can continue and, and push um, other elected officials to continue to think about connectivity, um, this particular um, so these particular set of units are, are wonderful, but they are largely, um, you know, kind of isolated, but also uh, very hard to get to. There are only maybe two or three buses that go up there. And so moving forward, as we start to invest in, in other parts of um, our city, if we can encourage um, uh, accessibility, uh, connectivity, um, and ensure that for some of our other um, initiatives when it comes to either some of our small business lending or um, you know, corridor revitalization that we don't forget uh, this particular project. Thank you. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? If not, then I uh, think a motion to approve would be in order. So move. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, so now we have a number of uh, agenda items under development services. Project. Hi, uh, uh, back again to present the fifth and Dinwiddie project. Um, authorization is requested to accept the proposal package by fifth and Dinwiddie Development LLC for the redevelopment of 34 parcels on the eastern and western portion of Fifth Avenue and Dinwiddie Street intersection. The eastern portion of a site will feature an adaptive reuse of a former uh, P, uh, DPW warehouse into commercial flexible space. The developer plans to add two stories uh, to a roof of existing building, and that's gonna be set back from a Fifth Avenue a frontage. The Western portion of the site includes two new buildings joined by a three-story sky, sky bridge. This uh, site will include commercial space, a new public plaza, and 171 mixed income apartments. 20% um, of the units will be affordable, ranging from 20% area median income to 60% AMI. In February 2019, the URA issued a request for proposals seeking redevelopment teams to purchase and redevelop this uh, fifth and Dinwiddie site. The goal of the RFP was to implement the community supported vision identified in the 2017 Uptown Eco Innovation District Plan. At the July 2019 URA board meeting, the board authorized exclusive negotiations with the developer for this project. Uh, Derek Tillman is a managing partner of Fifth and Dinwiddie Development LLC and should be in attendance if uh, you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, no questions, and uh, my part at least. I don't know if uh, Derek wants to add anything or if other members of the board want to offer any comments or questions. This isn't the last time we see this project, is it? No, there will be a final approval for final approval of financing and construction drawings. Okay. I know you. I know the URA staff um, and Derek have been working hard over the last probably two months um, to really move this forward. So I just want to thank everyone for their their due diligence. 
Yes, and I just wanted to add to that. Um, it has been uh, a lot of hard work um, to, to get to this point. Um, so I really want to thank uh, just the amazing development team um, really working to really redefine what it means to bring about equitable, comprehensive community development. Uh, I also want to echo those comments to thank the URA board, uh, I'm sorry, URA staff, but also the board uh, for their hard work um, and working with us uh, to, to get to this, you know, momentous occasion. Uh, so we're, uh, we're excited about this project, you know, what it's going to mean to this community, but really what it's going to mean to the entire city. So uh, again, thank you all. Thank motion you. To, uh, sorry. Motion to approve. Second. Motion in and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And now the skinny building. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Adelaide Roddy, project manager with the URA Development Services. And uh, next for your consideration is the Skinny Roberts Building proposal. Today, we are requesting authorization to accept the redevelopment proposal and enter into a disposition contract with PNC for the sale of the Skinny Roberts buildings located in Pittsburgh's Central Business District. Next slide, please. In 2013, the URA acquired the properties to save the buildings from demolition and spur growth downtown. Up until now, we've struggled to find anyone with a viable business plan capable of transforming the mostly vacant space into a bustling quarter. While an RCAP grant provided the buildings with a much needed facelift in 2014, they remain in need of repair and long-term management. Fortunately, uh, we were lucky to identify PNC uh, as a partner who is not only interested in activating the space, but we'd like to preserve the building's character. We've negotiated with them, done our due diligence, and we think we've struck a good deal for the city of Pittsburgh. PNC will step in and complete over $4 million in work to turn the upper floors of the Roberts building into flexible employee office space, as well as reconfigure the downstairs levels to provide incubator space that will house entrepreneurs and local businesses. PNC will also partner with a third-party art-based group to display art in the upper floors of the skinny building overlooking Forbes Avenue. The art display will rotate at least annually and feature local artists and students. Jumpstarting the initiative will be the city of Pittsburgh, who will run a six-month pop-up art exhibit starting next month that will honor African traditions. The URA will require PNC to partner with a preservation group to coordinate preservation activities at the buildings and ensure any facade or structural changes capture the spirit of the original design. Already, we've solicited input from the Pittsburgh Historic Landmark Foundation, PHLF, on the colors and materials to be used at the site. The URA will report a 99-year use restriction against the property to protect the buildings and prevent them from being demolished or altered. PHLF's legal counsel reviewed and provided comments on the draft deed restriction, which we've incorporated into the covenant agreement. The URA will retain air rights and transfer of development rights, prohibiting any further build out without URA consent. Finally, worth mentioning, this is only board action two of three, and prior to conveyance, this will be presented to the board one more time. Here with us representing the development team is Alyssa, VP of PNC Realty Services will be happy to answer any questions. Adelaide, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. We can. Thank you so much. Can I say a few words? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Thank you, and thanks to the URA board, um, you know, for allowing um, me to say a few words here. I'm a real estate developer. Uh, PNC, and I'm joined on the call today by our team uh, in Realty Services. And most recently, we had the privilege, privilege to work with uh, the URA and uh, the city on Project CARES, the homeless shelter at Second Avenue Commons. 
Um, and that project could not have been uh, successful without the dedicated involvement of the URA uh, as they were very instrumental early on and continue to be uh, throughout that project. So first and foremost, wanted to take the opportunity to thank the URA team for that. Um, for the Robertson Skinny Building, as Adelaide said, it's our desire to continue to invest in our community and really continue to serve the people in Pittsburgh. Um, we're very passionate about PNC continuing to play an important role in rejuvenating the downtown area through urban renewal. Uh, and with that, we want to see the Robertson Skinny Buildings preserved uh, in a tasteful way that respects both the city's history and the building's history uh, yet makes them pleasant, safe, and productive places for our employees to come to work. Uh, so as you know, we're going through um, an enormous banking acquisition, and we have an opportunity to potentially bring uh, a flexible work arrangement along with the piloting of new office concepts to the downtown area. Uh, and this may be able to serve that need as we grow. Um, so we're excited about the project. We're excited to partner with students and a variety of artisans to display and highlight art in the upper floors uh, of the skinny building and preserve uh, the details that make these buildings so special. Uh, the investment and again the reuse of the buildings uh, you know such as Skinny and Roberts is really how we believe um, we can collectively continue to attract and retain people in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, so thank you Adelaide again for all of your coordination on the project uh, thank you to the URA staff and the board for all of their input and consideration here um, and in partnering on projects like this and Second Avenue Commons uh, for making Pittsburgh just a great place to want to visit and work and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. I think it is probably pretty safe to say based on the volume of public comment we got about this uh, this building, that the skinny building is uh, one of the most beloved buildings in the city of Pittsburgh. We got, you know, some close to, including in the live public comment today, about 60 Pittsburghers took, that took time out of their lives to let us know how they feel about this project. Um, some of the comments simply asked us not to discuss this at all today. I think what we've just heard, uh, frankly reinforces the, the need to have these kinds of things aired publicly in public board meetings like this, because you know, it's my opinion, at least, that this plan as it stands, particularly a commitment uh, from PNC to, to work with a, you know, an approved upon preservationist partner to ensure that these buildings are protect, protected into the future, uh, actually meets most of the concerns, if not all of the concerns that we heard from those public comment submissions, uh, many of which simply said, uh, we don't want to see the skinny building destroyed, you know, save the skinny building from the wrecking ball. This is an important piece of Pittsburgh's heritage and history. We all agree that the skinny building and PNC agrees that the skinny building is an important piece of Pittsburgh's history. And the intention here is through this action to ensure that it actually is preserved. Um, and I, and I think I just want to say one thing and one other thing and then see if other board members want to add any any additional thoughts or comments. But to me, this is a kind of an interesting view into like the actual use and, and purpose of the URA itself. In 2013, you know, URA intervened in order to acquire this building specifically so that it would be saved from the wrecking ball. It was actually in very much in danger of being demolished when the URA acquired it. You know, the purpose of URA is to be able to intervene in our economy to achieve outcomes for the people of Pittsburgh that the free market on its own is not going to generate. And there are all kinds of outcomes that we need to intervene on from affordable housing to income inequality to occupational segregation to the wealth gap, urgent needs, which the free market on its own is clearly not meeting and not able to meet. And so the purpose of the URA, to my opinion, is to intervene in the market and achieve those kinds of outcomes for the people of Pittsburgh that otherwise would not be achieved. And so one small example of that is when the URA intervened to acquire this building and save it from the wrecking ball back in 2013. Another example is what we could do with the $1.3 million that PNC will be paying for these buildings. And it's my opinion that we should 
affirmatively dedicate the proceeds from the sale of this building to mission-based work that will achieve equity for the people of Pittsburgh, either in the realm of affordable housing or black business district development or, or quality job creation or something of the sorts. So those are my thoughts. Other board members want to get in here? Councilman? Sure. Um, one, I was going to ask, did you want to make that a formal motion? Yes, I think we should. Okay. Um, so I concur with all of what you just said. Um, however, I do want to make a motion to amend to add another condition. And this condition is really the result of a number, a lot of conversations that many in the preservation community were having with uh, my colleague, Councilwoman Gross, um, as well as uh, State Representative Ed Ganey. Um, and they work, and I believe this is acceptable to both the preservation community as well as uh, PNC Bank, I don't believe has any objection. Um, would you like me to read it now? Uh, yes, please. Okay. So the, the additional condition being added would be as a condition, as a condition precedent to closing, precedent to closing, excuse me, PNC and or the redeveloper will enter into an agreement with a third party preservation partner to provide guidance on preservation activities for the skinny building. And I can certainly send that over in writing as well. And if you could forward that to staff, that would be helpful to codify the resolution. Will do. Thank you. So that's, so that's a motion to amend. Uh, so procedurally, I think we can entertain a second on your motion to amend and then continue the discussion. I think that's how that should work. Agree. Need a second. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, I think with, so the, a, a motion has been, uh, an amended motion has been presented, uh, and now we can continue further discussion. So in further discussion, I would also add to the amended motion that we use your suggestion that proceeds from the sale of this building go to go towards equity-based development and let staff figure out what that looks like. I, I agree with that. I think that makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, I, the alternative is that it is simply to put it in the URA general funds. And I think this is money that we want to put to use achieving equity on behalf of the people of Pittsburgh. Just for clarity, is the discussion on the amendment or on the resolution at large? On the amendment uh, at the moment. Yeah. Sorry, Chair. So I, I will second the additional amendment. So now, uh, Representative Ganey, do you want to get in here? Uh, yeah, just quickly. I just want to thank the um, first. I want to thank Councilman Lavelle. I want to thank Councilwoman Deb Gross, um, the preservationist community, just for having a conversation about this and being able to come to a resolution. Sam, I want to thank you as well um, for coordinating the URA staff. Um, it just shows you when we start talking to one another what we can do. So I just want to compliment everybody and congratulate everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jody? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, it's, it sounds like there's some progress being made here that, that seems certainly on the, uh, on the right path. Um, you know, clearly there's still some concerns and objections from the community. Um, I, I kind of think the only reason I'm here is to represent the community. And so I'm not quite ready to vote yes on this. Um, you know, obviously supportive of using revenue to, you know, fund equitable development, affordable housing. Um, I'd like to see us not selling to banks, frankly, uh, as much as it seems like we are. Um, I'd love to talk about a community land trust uh, in this situation, but that's kind of where I am. Uh, any other thoughts, any other comments or questions? Yeah. 
So we have a, an, a motion to approve with the amendments presented by Councilman Lavelle first uh, regarding the memorandum of agreement on a, an appropriate preservationist partner and second, that URA staff would work to direct the proceeds from the sale to appropriate mission-based equity-driven uh, investments of URA. Is there any further discussion of the amended motions? Uh, if not, then uh, I will call the question. All those in favor of, of the amended motions? Aye. Aye. Sorry, I think. Vote aye. Director Powell, did you vote aye? I did. Yeah. Representative Ganey? Yes. Aye. Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, all those opposed? Post. Okay. Post. So the motion carries for, with a uh, tally of four to one, the amended motion, I should say, carries with a tally of four to one. And as previously noted, this will be back before us uh, with those conditions all intact for one final action before it's, uh, before it's, uh, uh, before any of the transaction is finalized. Thank you. I also want to thank, uh, you know, frankly, everybody who engaged in this process. Um, this is exactly why we have public board meetings, why the URA is a public entity is so that, you know, the public can weigh in on important decisions like this and shape the outcome. The outcome of this decision was very much shaped by the input that we received and the, you know, and the commentary that, that was sent to the URA in advance of today's meeting and by the, the work of Representative Ganey and Councilman Lavelle and Councilwoman Gross. Uh, next, we have a multifamily project at Southside Works. Um, and I think Adelaide is going to present on this too. Yes. Uh, Southside Works multifamily project is the proposed new construction of a seven story residential building along the Mangahila Riverfront in Pittsburgh's Southside neighborhood. The complex will include indoor and outdoor residential amenity space, upgrades to the Southwater streetscape, and linkages to the Heritage Trail. Today's request is to accept the proposal and enter into a disposition contract with Smar Road or related entity. And next slide, please. We're excited to partner with Samara Road to complete the last phase of this brownfield redevelopment. After over six months of extensive negotiations, we've managed to extract several, several concessions from the developer that will deliver key benefits to Pittsburgh residents. While the initial development agreement did not impose any conditions on Samar Road, the developer has graciously committed to go above and beyond the original agreement and help advance the URA's mission by providing several public goods. In addition to revitalizing a former steel mill brownfield site, which requires major geotechnical and remediation work, Samara Road will, in its redevelopment of the Southside Works site, create 17 affordable units at the neighboring Southside Flats property, invest more than $4.7 million in public infrastructure and improvements, including adding arts, lights, an ice skating rink, a playground for kids, and a modern town square to the area, all of which will be publicly accessible and feature free events, increase higher NWBE participation goals for the project from 17% to 25% for minority owned businesses and 17% to 10% for women owned businesses. And finally, uh, Samara Road will offer 5,000 square feet of discounted commercial space to locally based businesses. As part of this proposal, the URA will amend the development agreement to extend development rights through 2026 and increase the viability of future projects. Representing the development team today is John Reeser, Director of Acquisitions at Samara Road, who will be happy to answer any questions. Space 
So this isn't necessarily a question, but it's more of an observation. Um, we're calling it a multi-family project, but towards the issue Chief Powell often brings up, there's only studios, one and two bedroom units, which means you're not really addressing families. Just a, another, and I guess this is also not a question, but more of an observation, but um, acknowledging certainly that there are, you know, significant and meaningful um, concessions that the developer made that were not included in the original option agreement here. Um, you know, and, and again, keep in mind, this is, this, this goes back to SOFR's development rights, right? So SOFR had the development rights from an original deal that from a different era of the URA, uh, and then Samara Road uh, inherited or bought out those development rights, and, and then we had extended them a year or, or, or so ago. Um, and, you know, and, and that original deal didn't include any obligation to provide affordable retail space or to do park improvements, uh, you know, or to, to, you know, increase a commitment to minority owned businesses in the construction process or anything like that. So, you know, certainly acknowledge all of those positive outcomes, um, you know, and, and it didn't include any obligation for affordable housing. And there's some commitment to affordable housing here. But I just want to note that, you know, the 20% of units in the existing and neighboring uh, Southside Works, the flats building is a smaller number than 20 or even 10% would be in the new building. So the existing building is 83 units. So that's going to generate 17 units of affordable housing. I don't know if we know what the sort of size or bedroom makeup of those is? That would be helpful to know. Uh, 14 um, one bedrooms and, and three two bedrooms. Okay, thanks. You know, the new building's gonna have 246 units. Well, I'm sorry, so, I missed that. Say that again, say that last part again. I missed it when you talked about the bedrooms. I missed that part. Uh, 14, 14 one bedrooms and three two bedrooms. And, you know, I think one advantage there is that that's in an existing building. So in theory, those 17 units could be made available immediately, not at the end of construction. The new building has got a note, but it's gonna have 246 units. So 20% in that building would be 49 units. 10% in that building would be 25 units. You know, and what the developer is committing to delivering is more than they were obligated to do by the option agreement, but it's, 17 units in an existing building. I have a question about the flats. Are we, are we up to the, can we ask questions yet? Um, of course. Um, so a, a, cons, a concern that I have, while it's, it's wonderful that they'll be um, working on making sure that there are affordable units on the flat side of the development, uh, a concern would be that the affordable units would look, feel, be different than the ones at market rate. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you plan to ensure that you know the luxury amenities or whatnot that you have in the main development will be visible and, and um, uh, within the flats portion of it? Yeah, absolutely. Adelaide, can you unmute Andrew? Don Chez as well. He's our director of development. I believe he's on. Adelaide, uh, thank you for muting me. Um, as John said, my name is Andrew Don Chez. I'm director of development. To uh, address your question about the Southside Flats, the Southside Flats is uh, just up the street from this uh, proposed project. Um, the project is currently um, all market rate. Um, we've been undertaking a significant capital improvements project at Southside Flats, which includes updated units, replacing kitchen cabinets, floors, renovation of all the amenity spaces, lobbies, et cetera. Um, the units, the affordable units at Southside Flats will be identical to all the market rate units. So you know, we would characterize them as, as class A units. Um, they would be indistinguishable from the, uh, the affordable units would be indistinguishable from the market rate units. They would all be identical. Okay, thank you. On, on the affordable retail space, um, where the commitment is 5,000 square feet at uh, $15 per square foot, 
what, how does that compare to the market rate rents for retail space at Southside Works? Yeah, not not to give away all of our secret sauce that our competitors get to hear, but um, <laughs> I, I'd say if you know if it, it's location and size dependent, but on an average of five thousand square foot space on Carson Street would be you know above thirty dollars a square foot. Um, and the interior locations were were high twenties. And do you envision that as a single five thousand square foot uh, space or m multiple smaller spaces? I don't know what the yeah. Mix. So I, I it, I... it it it's probably a mix. Five thousand is a fairly big space. Just for reference, uh, back to the future, recently moved in in about a. a 1200 or 900 square foot space. Uh, it's a minority owned business. One of our woman owned business beyond the bleach, uh, she's in about 1300 square feet. So I think it'll probably range somewhere between, you know, one to 3000 square foot spaces. So it's probably comprised of two or three different spaces. Could you also uh, oh, sorry, Sam, go ahead. I was just wondering how those tenants will be selected? Um, <laughs> hard to say. I mean, through our natural marketing efforts, we were, we were able to secure back to the future and, and beyond the bleach. Our leasing team is up to speed on the type of tenants we are looking for. And, you know, with Southside Works, we've always been trying to bring more local tenants to, to our property. Um, so I think it's, it's, it will naturally occur just through our marketing efforts. Um, obviously speaking in public forums like this about, about the opportunity is helpful. Um, so it, uh, we have a targeted market approach for those local, locally owned businesses. And I, I think this is Andrew Dunch again, I think we would collaborate with the URA. Um, you know, we obviously have some tenants that we think could be potential fits. Um, and we would look to collaborate with the, with, uh, the board and the staff on uh, other opportunities and other potential tenants that uh, would benefit from this discounted space. Um, I know at one point we were talking extensively about green space being a part of this project. Just for those listening on the call, could you talk a little bit about the uh, public infrastructure and investments that you plan to make? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll let John take it, it, that one. <laughs> okay. Um, so green space improvements on the north lot, which is between American Eagle uh, and the Hyatt House. Um, we had a summer concert series. Um, we put in a bunch of mulch, seating, uh, brought in food trucks, and, and had free events all summer long for music uh, on the weekends and movies. Actually, it's rained almost every Wednesday through the summer, but the intent was to have free movies playing uh, every Wednesday. Um, additionally, within the town square, which is in front of the Cheesecake Factory, uh, we are about to start construction and develop uh, a, re a redone town square that includes a stage, includes vendor kiosks, has green space, park space, seating. Um, we'll be putting a playground in on Tunnel Park. Um, and we'll be putting the dog park in on D Tunnel Park as well. Uh, that includes a vendor space and free space for local residents to bring their dogs. Um, on the east lot, we've, in we've installed statues of penguins. We're going to have a community uh, event with the Pens Foundation to paint those penguins coming up in September. Uh, we've put a mural on one of the garages there that you can see from across the river. Um, and we continue to invest. In, in public art. We have Baron Batch as our resident artist on, on site. Um, so anything else I missed, Andrew? One, one additional thing to note, we're, we've also taken on the long-term maintenance obligations of all the, the public URA owned spaces within South Side Park. Yeah, in the South Shore Riverfront Park, that's right. Other questions or concerns? Uh, I have a question. Yep. This how long how how many blocks does this take up? It just so from the picture, it just looks really really long, and almost like it could sort of be a wall 
to everything else to the river. Yeah, I think the, the perspective and the rendering is a little uh, a little misleading. Um, it is a long building. It is a large building, but it's it's effectively one tax lot, one block um, on South Water Street. Um, but I think based on the the South Side Works master plan, the overlays was always intended to be developed um, as one one cohesive project. Which which block? Just help me understand. I'm just trying to envision it. Like if I'm at the uh, Hofbra House, where you to the right. So this is just to the what direction? Am I? North, north, just to the west of Hofbra House, um, right along the the Riverfront Park and the Heritage Trail. Um, that lot. Okay. Right up, right up from the marina. So and it's just that one lot. Okay. Yep, it's just yeah, that one lot. It, That's correct. It, if you look in the bottom image, the Hofbra House is to the left with the blue awning, blue and white awning. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Adelaide, is this this is the would be the final action on this? No, we will return to board to approve the final drawings and financing at a later okay. date. This is the um, acceptance of the proposal. Got it. Thank you. So, uh, I I wonder if it would be helpful for the board to have a more detailed presentation on the sort of financial underpinnings of the deal, particularly with respect to the feasibility for any additional units of affordable housing. Um, I know this is something that the, the, you know, the development team and the staff have worked on a lot over the last weeks and months, um, you know, but this is a big project and the last piece of a puzzle in, you know, decades long development of Southside Works. And, um, you know, bluntly, we only, we're not going to get a chance to redo this. <laughs> so, you know, I, there's a lot of positive outcomes here. I want to want to really acknowledge that and commend the development team for working so hard with the leadership of the URA uh, to get as far as you, as you come. Um, you know, but I, I at least have some questions about you know, why are we talking about 20% of units in an existing building as opposed to 10 or 20% or, or of, uh, of units in, in the new building, which is obviously much, much larger, and perhaps understanding the, you know, the kind of the financial constraints of the actual project itself might help the board to better to, to sort of grapple with this decision, um, in which case, you know, a, a a more detailed presentation between now and our next meeting might be available, might, might be appropriate. I think do, we would be happy to do that. In a, in a nutshell, the, the project does fall apart financially when you start adding affordable units uh, to the, the complex because there is such a, a large rent differential and the, the development will be unable to sustain a first mortgage uh, the construction costs also would exceed the value of the property, making it unattractive to investors. But, but happy to hold a separate session to run through the financial modeling. Yeah, I, I would also be curious, um, you know, just to, to understand a little bit more. Um, and I understand some of your concerns, Adelaide, but I know that the URA has been um, and developers have been creative in the past. Um, but I would, uh, you know ultimately like to, to understand some of the, uh, as Sam said, financial underpinnings a little bit more for voting. I would agree. I like I would like that as well. I'd like to have an more in-depth analysis um, yeah. so I have a better understanding myself. Yeah, to Adelaide's point, we'd be happy to do that. We, we put this project through the financial ringer. We, we kind of took their pro forma and pressed them to do a 20% set aside of affordability. And we were convinced the reasons Adelaide mentioned and others, including you know the, the crazy increase in construction costs recently, um, the fact that uh, there's a, a serious geotechnical or soil conditions that have to be remediated on the site, uh, together with some of the other constraints that the, the project just could support a 20% set aside. So we'd be happy to to run through that analysis with you. And I think it should be mentioned too that um, typically a project with this level of affordability, albeit in the other building, would, would be seeking and would get a tax abatement. Um, they're not getting the tax abatement here. 
this, this is something that they are kind of taking on their own shoulders here. So, but yeah, we'd be happy to run you through the financial modeling on this. I think that might be good. And again, I'm not like meaning to, you know, uh, discount uh, any of the work that has been done by, you know, the URA staff or the development team on this, but I do think it might be helpful for the board to, uh, to, act, to see that analysis and, and have a presentation for the whole board. So with that in mind, do we need a motion to table an agenda item for a month? Or, you, or I think if we just- yeah, you, you could have an option to, um, you know, to vote on it with uh, the briefing being a, a condition to further action, um, or you can have a motion to hold for a month. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would suggest a motion to hold for one month pending, uh, you know, board briefing on the, you know, the financial analysis that staff has done. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Yeah. Uh, Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Again, I, you know, the Samara Road team, thank you for your presentation today and for showing up and for work continuing to work closely with the with the staff on moving this forward. Uh, you know, I think it this this is you know sort of a necessary step in getting the, the information to all of us so that we can really make an informed decision here. Yeah, thank thank you yeah, all sure. for your time. Yeah, Chairman Lewis was going to add, we, we appreciate it. Um, you know, we've worked very closely with Greg and Adelaide and the staff. Um, I think we've provided them uh, a, a, a lot of information on why this project has to be kind of put together this way. Um, I would just add and, and ask the board to consider that, you know, this is a, a long vacant lot that, you know, as you mentioned, is kind of the last piece in the investment in Southside Works. Um, you know, and for us, we view this as an investment in the overall project, not necessarily just this individual project, which includes all the investment in the public spaces, um, you know, the, the leasing to local tenants, including Fred Rogers and others, um, all of that, um, public spaces, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, we think that's an important part of this project. We think it's an important part of the continued revitaliz revitalization of Southside Works. Um, and, you know, we look forward to continuing our partnership with the URA. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I think the feeling is mutual. Um, all right, so then uh, now we're on to Hayes, uh, sorry, Hazelwood and Woods Village. Yes, uh, next for your consideration is uh, Woods Village. Adeline, uh, oh, sorry, I'm, wrong slide, I apologize. Uh, the Woods Vill Village project, we heard some public com comments earlier. It is the uh, proposed new construction of a mixed use project in Pittsburgh's Hazelwood neighborhood. Uh, today, we are requesting authorization to give Oak Moss Consulting exclusive negotiation rights to 47 publicly owned parcels surrounding the Woods House, uh, a historic landmark, which the developer recently turned into a Scottish restaurant. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, row houses uh, previously occupied the now cleared parcels, but the land has been vacant for the past 40 years and has been overtaken by nature. The developer, Krish Pandya, is interested in doing an infill project here. He has a, a general development scheme, which is to build a mix of one, two, and three bedroom duplex homes featuring small ground floor retail spaces. The purpose of this board action is to give the developer more site control and flexibility as he explores his concept and advances conversations with lenders. The developer hopes to make this the first opportunity zone project in Pittsburgh. The project has generated significant community interest uh, as you heard earlier today. Krish will continue to engage community members to workshop the concept and flesh out his proposal. He will explore both affordable housing and a job training program to be contingent upon financing. Once he advances his financing, he'll be able to nail down the exact number of affordable units 
as well as determine the viability of an apprenticeship program that will aim, aim to train residents in the construction trades. As, as part of this approval, the developer will need to commission several environmental and ecological studies to assess the suitability of the site. A developer will need to prepare a zoning plan, which outlines the benchmarks the project must hit to turn hillside parcels into a dense multifamily residential development. And finally, uh, the developer will need to demonstrate how the site will be developed in accordance with the Greater Hazelwood Neighborhood Plan. Representing the development team today is Krish Pandya, Managing Member of Oakmoss Consulting, who will be happy to answer any questions. Can you, can you guys hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Great. Good afternoon. This is uh, Krish Pandya from Oak Moss. Uh, just first, thank, thank you for the opportunity to present the project to the, the board. And uh, thank you to Adelaide and other URA members uh, and staff uh, for working with us over the last uh, year or so on, on the concept of this project. But um, just, just to touch on a few quick points, and then I'll, I can answer any questions. Uh, you know, it is our intent to make sure that we are aligned with the Greater Hazelwood Neighborhood Plan when it comes to connectivity, walkability, and family housing, and, and, and our intent to continue working with the residents uh, to make that happen. Um, we are looking at cr creating affordable retail space for small local businesses as a small part of this. Um, the initial discussions with the community have been really focused on adding three more three and two bedroom homes because there has been a, um, a, a serious gap of family rental housing in Hazelwood and uh, we've changed the focus our focus to kind of build our unit concepts around that each unit has its own parking um, and the retail space has a parking lot as well so that the congestion on the street uh, is limited. Uh, we also wanted and we have been working over the last uh, six to 12 months with uh, some local contracting and construction companies to create a uh, sort of level one, level two type construction training apprenticeship program, which would uh, not replace any existing programs, but could be a good opportunity for us to take advantage of the, this project, as well as some of the other construction projects that are going to happen in the region. And lastly, Hazelwood being an opportunity zone, we really thought this would be a great catalyst to raise interest and create a market-based project with some affordable housing and it gets some opportunity zone investments in a timely fashion um, and, and put some focus uh, around Hazelwood. So um, those are some of the principles. Uh, you know, we, we, like Adelaide mentioned, we intend to take the environmental uh, comments very seriously. One of the first few things that we're going to be doing once we have access is a geotechnical survey, um, a storm water management study, and all that will be incorporated into the next stage of engineering and design and presented. Uh, we will also, you know, we've made a few changes already to preserve as much green space as we can, but we're going to be looking and working with uh, the environmental planners and the councilmen on how we can maintain a, a certain green corridor and even find a way for us to be, uh, you know, take on the obligations of maintaining the adjacent greenway, which, uh, which is connected to the development. So let me just stop there and see if anybody has any questions or comments or even recommendations for us as we move forward. Any questions or comments? Who, who is the Opportunity Zone Fund? So uh, we've, 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 there's a couple of letters of interest we've got uh, and, and some of those are under confidentiality agreements, but we have one opportunity zone fund that has, has, has provided a letter of interest for um, a significant portion of investment right now. Obviously that is subject to further development and uh, pressure testing the, the, the returns and, and the costs on the project. Uh, but uh, so far we've got one fund that's interested. Um, and it, is it a local fund or a national it, fund? Or? It, it, is a, it is actually a local fund. Interesting. Okay. And can you say a little bit more about the, the job training or job placement program yes. that you're 
contemplating? Absolutely. So we've uh, we've been working with a company called Dots and uh, um, and another uh, group of uh, another construction company to develop a twelve week basic training program. And and the purpose of the program is not to replace any union supported training program, but just build the general awareness of of people um, on on some basic trades before they can step on any construction site. And as the program um, as the program is uh, uh, progresses, it's about twelve weeks of classroom training, and we'd be looking for setting up some space in Hazelwood to do that. But following that, the last piece, uh, piece of the training, we would be we wanted to time it with the activities on the project. So as as the last final piece of this training, they people would be actually working on site uh, after they've passed certain safety. Um, standards as well as uh, they're, they're fit to be able to be on site. And the purpose is after this, when they do apply for any um, certified apprenticeship programs, it's they start off at a different level and they have a much better uh, chance of getting accepted as well as performing better. I mean, I, I, that sounds like a laudable goal. There are existing pre-apprenticeship programs in Pittsburgh that have automatic placement in apprenticeships and therefore lead directly to longer term, higher wage careers in the building trades. Mm -hmm. And I would prefer to see you working with an existing program like that, that actually guarantees that, that the participants are going to end up in a long term family sustaining career, as yes. opposed to potentially a pathway into a lower paid non union construction job, which doesn't really meet the URA goals of creating quality job growth for the city of Pittsburgh. No, that's 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 a fair comment. And, and we, we can look at doing that as well. Um, I do I I do have I don't have it right in front of me, but we, we have uh, a list of these programs that you talked that we are, have started socializing. So I think this is this would be a good discussion to have with them so that we're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, but the whole idea here is to leverage the project uh, and provide an opportunity for uh, folks to, to participate while the construction is going on in a safe manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it makes a whole lot of sense and it's kind of what we have tried to do in the lower hill as well. Um, you know, but I think on the, on the back end of the project, people are better off if they're then in a career and don't have to go looking for a job in the, in the construction industry and probably hop from, from project to project and probably get lower wages than if they ended up automatically with an apprenticeship and a career. Absolutely. And, you know, and it also then helped to diversify the, you know, the, the construction and building trade unions. Yep. No, I, 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 absolutely. That's a very good point. I had a um, question. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. Keep cutting you off. Uh, I had a question about um, affordability at this point. I don't know if you can speak to the levels that you'd like to reach and then about for the residential as well as for if you have any intentions for um, affordable commercial space. Yes. Yes, and and you know we've set some some high level. Um, there's a good, good question. There's set some high level goals for us. We are targeting twenty percent, uh, and somewhere between sixty to eighty percent AMI. But a lot of this is contingent on us actually completing the next phase of project development, finalizing the cost structures and our fine pro formas and the financials, and of course, getting support from the lenders to be able to 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 manage that. We feel we can get there. Um, you know, and we've been talking with Adelaide uh, and Nick on up ways that we could potentially improve the financials of the project through whether it be through tax abatements or other programs. We haven't even looked at those right now. You know, we've kind of just focused on getting the basic project developed, uh, the concept developed. Uh, but at, in this next phase is when we'll be able to pull all these levers. And our goal would be to try and get to 20% affordability across all the three bedroom, two bedroom units, one bedroom. So however, we, whatever mix makes sense working with the URA. Um, and then, you know, the, in terms of the level of affordability, I think that's a function of, you know, how if we can get, make this thing an attractive a uh, project from from market perspective that that can subsidize these the better off we're going to be so uh good question and we want to pin work with the ura to pin all that down thank you my last question is what is what was the original use of this space before it got retaken by nature 
uh, it was housing. It was literally, I mean, if you look at, if you look at historically, uh, this has been a highly dense uh, uh, housing uh, uh, community neighborhood uh, with a lot of people working at GNL Steel uh, and others. And it, as you go back further on, so it was a highly dense uh, 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 community. Uh, and that's the reason, even when you look at the size of the parcels, there's a lot of parcels, but the size of each parcel is extremely small. So there were small uh, homes or, or houses there. And at one point, there were townhomes as late as 2000, and I would say 2008 or nine, when the last rows of townhomes um, were essentially uh, evacuated or, or, or left to, to fall down. And that's one of the reasons we feel like that your technical studies are going to be important because we don't know what is sitting there. Uh, we suspect there's going to be a lot of old houses uh, and debris, uh, which we'd want to try and understand uh, in the next phase a little better as we build out our engineering and design plans. Okay. Other thing, I think on top of that, I know that you're, um, you still have a, a lot of, um, investigative work to do with the geotechnical surveys and what have you, but has there been any interest or exploration on trying to include maybe a green space within this project or, um, you know, working to um, maybe if there's another adjacent, um, you know, plot of, of land that the that nature has retaken, uh, maybe try to uh, work to permanently preserve that. Um, any any questions or excuse me, any conversations in, in those realms? Yes, absolutely. So when we started, if you look at, uh, you know, it's it's a small picture, but if you look at our master plan, uh, initially we had uh, units all the way up to Silwyn. And in the discussions that we had, one of the things we decided to do was pull down all the units uh, from Silwyn to allow that green space and maintain that green space. Um, the other thing we wanted to do is there's two sets of steps that are connecting Monongahela and Silwan on the left and the right hand sides, which are really in bad shape. And if you look at it, 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 it stops people from moving in the community between Silwan and Monongahela. And everything on the on the left hand side of the picture, as I look at it, is where the green greenway starts officially. So if you what the things that we have talked about, and this is a a conversation that will continue with the community is how do we actually enhance the green space and the greenway that we're sitting next to it? How do we improve the connectivity? And so this, this draws people into the development, into green spaces in the development, but improves the connectivity into the greenway through the development. And what can we do with the walkways around it to make sure that now you see more traffic from the community going into the green spaces and, and, and enjoying it. And the last thing that I, I, I'm committed to working with, uh, we are committed to working with, with the councilman and, and the community is, you know, if there are certain obligations that we can do, and, and there, are, I, there is definitely an opportunity to maintain the greenway better, uh, right adjacent development, we'd be happy to see how we can participate in that process and improve that connectivity as well as take on some of those maintenance obligations. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? This is really, this is what's being asked is the beginning of exclusive negotiations. So during which time, I, you know, I think we should expect progress on, you know, hammering out the details on the, on affordability and uh, trying to go as deep and as broad as possible. And, you know, I think you should expect additional questions on this job training program and perhaps we can help link you to the folks running like the Intro to the Trades program okay. or the APRI, Breaking the Chains of Poverty program or some of those already existing programs that do yes. provide a pathway into a longer term career. Absolutely. No, that would be great. Um, so uh, un unless uh, board members have concerns with moving forward with uh, exclusive negotiations, again, this would come back to us two more times, I think, right? Correct, before we convey the deed to the developer. 
I think, you know, certainly part of what we heard in public comment was, uh, and what seems to be apparent here is, a, uh, you know, eagerness on the part of the developer to engage with the community and listen and accept feedback. So there's some concerns here, but we have time to work them out. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? And if not, then I think I would ask for a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Motion is seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, this one on Hunt Armory is being held because they weren't uh, MWDE compliant yet. So we'll come back no, to that. No motion is necessary for that one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and then uh, finally, we have the Somerset at Frick Park extension, uh, Paul Martinchik. Uh, hi, Paul Martinchik, um, engineering manager at the URA. Um, requesting approval for construction of the Squirrel Hill South Somerset of Frick Phase Two uh, Frick Park Extension. Um, enter into agreement uh, for construction with John Zatola Landscaping in amount not not to exceed uh, two million two hundred twenty four thousand eight hundred and nineteen dollars and twenty four cents. Um, additionally, uh, enter into agreement. Uh, for construction management, construction inspection services with Cosmos Technologies in an amount not to exceed $85,000. Uh, both of these contracts will be funded with the Somerset Tax Incremental Financing or TIF uh, fund. Uh, next slide. Just a little, little bit in additional information. So this is the last part of the um, Somerset at Frick development, uh, you know, residential in it, and um, uh, it's a two-acre park overlooking the uh, Mon Valley. Um, we're looking to start construction this fall and finish that out um, next spring and early summer. Um, so we'll, we'll be doing uh, general site grading right now. That's a, there's just a uh, a lawn green space that um, is a cap to the existing slag dump. As you all know, this was originally a um, slag dump that's been converted to residential development. Um, so we'll have um, landscaping. Um, uh, we'll be planting trees, shrubs, perennials, and uh, have some open lawn space for recreation. Uh, other amenities are there's, there's a pavilion at either end of the park, and there's a center um, uh, kind of rose garden in the middle with a couple of arbors flanking either side. And there's also um, some swings from the arbors as well for um, just kind of hanging out. Uh, we also have um, stormwater management in the form of a bioretention area toward the far end of what the picture is there. And in addition to this, we're going to do repairs to the existing sidewalk along Parkview where there's a, a degraded um, slate tiles uh, in the sidewalk. We're replacing that with, um, uh, I suppose, the aggregate um, strips. Um, in terms of our MWB compliance, um, the contractor is committed to over uh, MWBE. Right now, we're working to up the percentage. He's got a very good percentage in the Women owned, we want to get a few more percent out of the, the MBE, and we're working with them on that. Um, I'd also like to note is uh, Cosmos Technologies is, is going to be providing the uh, CMCI services, and they are a minority firm. So under that contract, we'll have 100% uh, MWBE participation. I'd like to also note, um, as this, is a, this, that this will become a uh, city park, an extension of Frick Park, and will be owned and maintained uh, by the uh, uh, Department of Public Works of the city. Uh, there's also a commitment for um, an art enhancement in this. We've we put out an RFP several months ago, um, interviewed several artists and selected Tim Cullen, a local artist who does a lot of public work. Um, you've probably seen his work around the city. 
And we're currently working with the community on, um, on that design of, of, the, uh, of the art. And um, so that'll be a nice enhancement to the project. Uh, I guess any questions at this point? Uh, good question. Sorry, was that a motion? Some move. I got a sticky mute button. Sorry. Second. <laughs> motion is second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Paul, sorry, I mispronounced your last name. Oh, uh, it's okay. I do it myself sometimes. And uh, finally, we have uh, the disclosure agenda. And if there are no questions or highlights to pull out from the disclosure agenda, then a motion to approve it in its entirety would be in order. So move. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And uh, that concludes today's meeting. Unless there's any good and welfare or other announcements, then a motion to adjourn would be in order. So move. Second. <laughs> any further discussion? All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Meeting is adjourned. We'll see everybody uh, on October the 7th, I think. No, the 14th, October the 14th. Uh, and then board members should be on the lookout for an email, try to schedule an executive session on the Samara Road briefing. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody.